Um, we apologize for the uh, earlier mix-up and grabbing the space and everything. I think it just goes to show, it goes to show and highlight the difficulties that we as a community have to get something as simple as reserving a space on campus. So, uh, <laughs> that was spin it. So, uh, <laughs> I want to introduce, although I'm sure you guys all, uh, uh, most of you already I know these two distinguished professors, Professor Ricardo Ortiz and Professor Elizabeth Velez. Uh, professor, if you want to give like a short introduction about yourselves, that'd be great. Yeah. Um, hi, so I'm, I'm Ricardo Ortiz and I've been at Georgetown for 16 years. And I uh, specialize in U.S. Latino literature and I'm in the English department and I'm the director of the master's program in the English department. And I was born in Cuba, raised in L.A., undergrad at Stanford, Ph.D. from UCLA. Not as soon as they stayed in Dartmouth College before I came to Georgetown. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I went, they made me go first. So. Um, I'm Elizabeth Bellas. And actually, I should say, and I am not Latina. Um, and like a million years ago, when I got married, it did change my last name, which I wouldn't do now, but I did. Um, but it's Bellas. There's an accent on it. So just say. Everyone, you pronounce you could pronounce it more correctly than I do. No, we do not. <laughs> <laughs> um, I work for the Community Scholars Program in CMEA. Um, teach the program. We're part of the Southside Continent Program. I'm sort of the academic director of the program. Teach in the English department. Teach in the Women and Gender Studies department. Um, and I am from Alabama originally. Wait, what was that, Erin? I saw some eye rolling. <laughs> um, lived in Texas for a while. Uh, my husband is Mexican American, born in Dallas. Um, his grandparents came over from the Southern East Coast of Sea in the early 1900s. Um, I have two sons, both of them are Latino and white, I guess. So, and I have a lot of interest in Latino, Latina literature as well. I've been reading it for years, but I'm not an expert in my <laughs> Thank okay. you, professors, for that. That's, thank you very much. So, uh, you know, the whole point of this discussion here is to discuss machismo, uh, Latino gender roles, and how they have changed, how they are today, and how you know, they will be in the future. Um, this is a safe space. Anyone is welcome to. Uh, speak candidly, and we encourage audience participation. But we're going to start things off with just a small question to, to uh, you two uh, professors. Uh, and basically, we'd like to know your opinion on how, uh, why has machismo, you know, the stereotypical image of the dominant male in Latino culture, why has it been perpetuated for so long? Why has it been able to stay alive for so long? Do you want to start? Um, Maybe you can start, but before you start, um, let me do this now before I forget. So I'm basically here to uh, uh, distribute propaganda. Um, there's, there's a, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, what? Yeah, yeah, so um, I know I, I sent this to, to the Mecha um, uh, e uh, email address, but these are postcards. And um, for anybody who wants, there are posters. I'll put these over here. Um, or later, but um, so this is all on on called it's it's a it's a it's a two day event. So it's starting I think on Monday night and it goes all day Tuesday. Um, and the the the, the relevant um, events for this group. So I, I brought this because it's relevant to this group. There are two um, important Latino writers, two men, who are both um, going to be part of the program. And one is head is one is one of the headliners on opening night in Gaston, and his name is Justin Torres. And he's a very young, young meaning that he's only got one novel out and that he started at the beginning of his career. The novel is called We the Animals. Um, he's, he's kind of like the up and coming new Latino fiction writer in this country on the strength of this first book, right? Um, and he's openly gay. And I think, in, in other, I mean, the, the, the We the Animals is a very beautiful, beautiful, but hard and um, in some ways violent novel about growing up um, in, in his family, poor and. Um, you know, half, half Latino, half, half um, I'll say white in general because I'm going to forget the ethnicity of his mom, um, with four, four young boys uh, in a household that was sort of dominated by the, by the woman, but also in, in, in other ways by the, by, the, by the father. 
but but really kind of in a sense that that, that, that laid out the sort of foundation of life for these for these um, for these young for these young brothers, right? Um, so he's going to be part of the headlining thing on Monday night. I think that's right, right on on the thirty first. Is that with the yeah. okay? And then the next day, uh, the the Mexican American Chicano poet, uh, who's had a very long career and a very well established career, Jimmy Santiago Baca, is going to be is going to be part of a of a of a of a reading event. Um, and he's had a really extraordinary life. He used to be in prison. Um, he's just one of these really kind of embodiments of, of surviving the worst kinds of conditions and making an, an extraordinary life and career out of out, out of out of out of really like um, uh, the most challenging kinds of kind of kind of background. Um, and he's a remarkable poet. So they're they're both going to be part of this this larger event, um, which is all about sort of economic. What we now call it economic precariousness or economic precarity. Living in a world where even in the most developed parts of it, um, many, many many of us, even even regardless of our education, sometimes uh, live fairly fairly economically precarious just uh, uh, existences. Okay. So now you can answer. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, do, would you mind repeating the question? I got very caught up. Um, the opening question, <laughs> question I thought I would start with would be like, uh, in your opinion. How has machismo and the stereotypical generals of Latino culture been able to stay alive for so long in our society and our community to this okay. day? I mean, one of the things I teach is feminist theory and the Women and Gender Studies program. And I think why and how are two of the huge questions that we don't, we're never able to answer, but it's sort of where we begin. And I think that question assumes a truth that Yes, there is this thing, this construction of masculinity called machismo that has been part of Latin culture for a long time. Um, historically, I'm not equipped to talk, but I wanted to bring you another voice, and I wanted to bring you the voice of a Latino writer. Um, have any of you read, I know some of you have, Juno Diaz? Cool. Yes. <laughs> Juno Diaz, he, he's a Dominican writer, um, and lately, his latest book is called um, this, to, this is How You Lose Her. This is How You Lose Her, and it elicited a fair amount of criticism because it's about women and the way he loves women and adores women and what women look like and what beautiful asses women have and how gorgeous Dominican women in particular are, and it's elicited some criticism feminist saying, hmm, is, is Diaz, does Diaz critique machismo or does he participate in that culture? So he was interviewed, um, this is last year, and the interviewer said, and I hope I'm answering the question eventually, I'm going to let him answer it, not you, but yes, he is. Um, the interviewer said, were you Dominican and a super macho player boy sense that you describe in the novel, and actually I think he means it in the collection of short stories. What do you think of that cultural standard of masculinity, and what kind of man did you want to be growing up? And I think that's a huge question in all of this, which is what kind of man did you want to be growing up, and who established those constructions of manhood? So here's what Diaz said last year. I was a super macho as my father wanted me to be. I could box, I could shoot, I could walk through my neighborhood at four in the morning and nobody said shit. I thought my mother and sisters were less than people. I was my father's son, and I'm still trying to uncover it myself. I'm still wrestling with the consequences. Masculinity is another of those wonderful myths that shape individuals and societies and that deliver catastrophic blows to both. As a kid, I wanted to be the kind of man that my father would love, that would dispel all my vulnerability and fear. It didn't happen. So I guess what I'm saying, and what I think Diaz is saying, um, first of all, I think we better be very careful about seeing that she's not as something that only exists in Latino culture. I mean, the other word is misogyny. And we live, I think, still in a patriarchal culture where many men think they're sisters and their mothers. And I think, you know, it's interesting, 
what he didn't add to that is girlfriends, wives, women that he might be in relationships are less than human. So yes, I think these ideas are persistent culturally. Um, I'm a feminist who believes that misogyny has existed across culture, across time, um, and across place. So it's, I don't want to just say, oh, Latino culture is the worst in terms of machismo, because I don't think it is. Um, but I think Diaz's answer is, you know, one way to look at that is if you are in a group that's oppressed, then yeah, hypermasculinity makes them sense. And there are ways in which that oppression can eventually sort of filter down to other people in your lives, particularly women. And I think that's true in a lot of cultures. All right, I'll shut up. No, keep talking. That's how she silences me. Anyway. <laughs> This is how it's going to go tonight. We we're, we're, sort of a, we're sort of a comedy act, so yeah. you just have to know this is going to be part of what happens tonight. I say we really adore one another, baby. Oh, yeah. so, um, <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, uh, just to get the, the, the jokes out of the way, um, uh, a this is not this this isn't a joke. It's not funny. But but the first thing to say about your question and, and that is posed to Professor Bellas and to me, right? Um, that makes it interesting and just it just sort of sets up the sort of the problematic that we're going to be dealing with in terms of a community and the challenges we face, right? Is that neither of us is a historian, and you asked a historical question, okay? So um, in terms of like how we can uh, uh, operate and, and, and do what we do as, ex as experts and say that we have an expertise in what we do, um, I just wanted on the table that we are both literature scholars, and yet we're the only two people at Georgetown <laughs> that you can actually pose this question to about um, the history of the, of, of the community that's now the largest cultural minority in this country. Is that right? Okay, good. So anyway, did, show this wait, to everyone. Did everybody get what Colonel meant when he said, we're the only two people who can pose that question What did you mean? Well, that, 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 that <laughs> we're, um, we're really two of the very few people on this campus um, who, who, who avow an expertise in anything to do with US Latino culture at all. So, um, that's that's what that meant, and that's that's just that's just you know that's just Georgetown. That's 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 where we are. So so I'm not a historian, but let me try to you know begin to answer this question historically. But first, let me tell a couple jokes. So um, uh, this whole thing sort of reminds me what you were saying. Reminds me of something that um, the comic Marga Gomez, who's an out lesbian comedian, who's not as famous now as she used to be in the uh, late '90s, early part of the last decade. But you can look up her work. She has a really great um, CD called Hung Like a Fly. Um, <laughs> that begins with this sort of thing where she talks about being out and everything else and what it meant for like even her non-Latina friends to say to her, yeah, but you come from a really homophobic culture, what it was like growing up in this particularly sort of homophobic culture. She, said, she says, well, you know, yeah, Latino culture is homophobic and also misogynistic, but is it more homophobic and, and more misogynistic than other cultures? Well, let's just say it's differently homophobic <laughs> and differently misogynistic, right? So that's one. The other is just sort of, I, I get, I'm reminded of, of you know, um, my evolving relationship with my, my father, who was, you know, in many ways certainly kind of um, inculcated in um, the mentality of machismo and the practice of machismo as a, as a Cuban and the Cuban-American um, man. Um, but he was, he, was, he was a good guy and he was a good father. Um, but he was conservative, right? And so in the 80s, like, he used to like, hang out in, his, in the garage listening to Rush Limbaugh on the radio. And he, you know, he let like Rush sort of like analyze culture for him, and then get him all really pissed off about, you know, the way that culture is unfair to white, to straight white men. Um, and, and talking once about like the National Organization of Women, this is really going back now to the 1980s, right? This is how old some of this discourse is, and some of these debates are. All very that I would come into the, the garage and say, you know, hey, what's up, Dad? And he'd say, um, well, you know, I just, I just. I'm just wondering, like, if there's a national organization for women, why isn't there a national organization for men? <laughs> and, you know, I was in grad school at UCLA and sort of getting my education and knowing what was going on, and I said, there is, Dad, it's called society. <laughs> there's a, you know, there's, men are fine, men are, men are being taken care of by, by, by the larger organization that we call, our, that we call reality. So, um, just to say that I think that this is, you know, the, these are sort of some of the, the terms that we need to have, um, on the table as we have this discussion. Um, but yeah, you know, it's, um, I think in terms of whatever might be unique about 
about misogyny and, uh, and sexism and heterosexism and sort of the larger kind of demands that patriarchy makes on everybody, right? That there is something maybe particularly, if we want to call it sort of Latino about it, that is particularly Latino American um, and has a set of particular um, sort of connections back to all the different ways that we inherit this from whatever Latin American cultures we come from and that in turn the inheritance there goes back as far as sort of Catholic patriarchal Spain and you know and, and, and conquering in colonial Spain in this hemisphere and um, and whatever sort of remain whatever could survive of of whatever might have been the sexism of some of the indigenous and traditional cultures that were um, either either conquered, colonized, um, or transported to this to this hemisphere by by by, by Europeans um, in the course of the colonial imperial you know ex uh, experiment, right? Um, that's 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 we're the heirs of all that, right? But that's a really complicated inheritance. That's a really complicated legacy, and we could we could um, you know we could tease out a lot of different threads of it, right? But it's not coming from one place and only doing one thing. It's a very, very complicated, uneven, heterogeneous kind of but, process. I mean, there are theorists who would argue that colonialism is probably the most guilty. And, but again, I mean, we're not historians. Um, but in terms of creating machismo, and I think Ricardo's right, there's lots and lots of different threads, and there's plenty of guilt to go around. So. To say that we know, I think, is difficult. Thank you very much for that, professors. And uh, so, as you guys said, you guys are not historians, so let's shift the conversation to now. And I'd like to take the opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> We're good at that. Yeah. We know something about now, but go ahead. <laughs> we like to uh, we like to open the discussion uh, to everyone in the audience, including the professors, to you know kind of have like a back and forth going. And and uh, I'm just going to throw some some points out there for you guys to consider uh, before we get going. And that is. Um, the, the now of Latino culture. Let's let's start uh, at Georgetown, for example. Uh, the two biggest Hispanic groups on campus, Mitch and Lassau, are headed by women. Uh, to the extent of my knowledge, uh, there are more Latino women than Latino men on college campuses uh, in the whole country. Um, despite that, despite the fact that women are making incredible advances in higher education uh, at higher at faster rates than men, uh, you know we still have, as we just said, these stereotypical uh, gender roles of, of of the Latino, of not, not necessarily Latino, but the machista dominating women in this culture. Um, keep that in mind, uh, and, and let's hear from everyone here. Okay, no, I, I'd rather hear from you. <clears throat> yeah, what, what, what do you guys make of the, the reality of those they just kind of described? I mean, they're gonna just throw something out. Yeah. Um, I think that um, at least dealing like through like um, our fraternity and a lot of the stuff like that we have found out like through research and a lot of those things, the I think masculinity is what's holding men down. Um, the whole entire factor of like you have to be prideful, you have to like stand up for yourself. You can't show fear, you can't show pain, you can't show this, this, and that. Like within the Latino culture, is the same thing that's holding our Latino males behind. Yeah. It's the reason why they're not going to college is the reason why they're not graduating from high school. And it's the reason why like a lot of them drop out of college. And I think that's one of the biggest things that like, um, a thing that we see as a strength is actually a weakness. Yeah. I think, um, just to, to add to that a little, I just got finished sitting on admissions. Um, and I looked at a lot of Latino, Latina students and just to go back to this idea, it's not just Latino men that are more represented, I mean, less represented right now. There are more women in college campuses, period. Right. In the African American community, more than in the Latino community, there are fewer men applying to college. But you're right, <coughs> there are fewer Latino men applying to college than women. Georgetown is one of the schools, and I just think you should know this because you go here that makes a very conscious decision to keep men and women pretty much e in equal number. So that at this point you get a tiny bit of an edge, which I don't argue with, because I think colleges make all kinds of, the ways in which admissions make decisions, it's just, there are many, many factors. But it's, a, it's a permanent action for men. 
Well, a tiny <laughs> edge of the sun, that's right. Because there is this concern about, gosh, what would happen to a school that was 75% women? And there are schools where that's happening. And people are thinking, oh, well, what's to go there? You need, it needs to be 50-50. But in response to your question about masculinity and machismo hurting young men, I absolutely agree. One of the things that Diaz said, I read a lot about what Diaz thinks about Manchismo, and, and what I like about him is that he makes it so clear that it is a struggle for him to decolonize his mind, to get this, you know, to not internalize this ideal. But one of the things he said, there's one place in, you know, a Manchismo culture where men can be really, really vulnerable to women, and that's in bed. But otherwise, you have to be tough, nothing can get you, and as you say, you have to be prideful. And I agree, those things, I think, raising two sons, I think those things are destructive. So I think you're right. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I, I would say that it's been a really frustrating thing to watch happen because, um, uh, you know, I mean, I, I, there, there are a lot of different ways that I could connect my own success, right, to, to being gay and to um, having a different relationship to my masculinity than maybe the conventional Latino, young Latino man coming from a background like mine would have, right? So, you know, I mean, my family got here in 1966, um, you know, typical sort of Cuban-American immigration story, but we didn't have anything. I mean, it wasn't like we brought all our property with us, like people think all these Cubans did. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, the, we, 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 were, we were legally allowed in the country, so immigration was, easy, was legally easy. Um, once, once you were allowed in, um, and there was a so, sort of a social support network, and, and we did, we would get sort of like you know um, state support too when we were starting out. Um, but my parents both worked in factories all their lives, and um, uh, you know, and, and, and so I grew up uh, in a very working class background. My father was, as I said, in many ways a very typical sort of Cuban Cuban American man. Um, you know, I didn't know that I didn't, I didn't know that I was gay for a really long time, but I but I did know that I really liked to read. I did know that I really liked to draw and I really liked to have certain kinds of, you know, I was creative and, and expressive and imaginative and all that. It didn't, wasn't all that into sports, it was totally, you know, uncoordinated and, uh, and, and kind of too competitive for my own good in other ways, right? But still, <laughs> just not, not somebody all that interested in, in beating other people up um, or, being, or, or having a certain kind of aggression in general, right? Um, no football. Or anything like that, right? Um, and, and, I, and I actually grew up, even you know, in spite of my father, I grew up in a household of women because um, my my, mo my my mom's mother came over with us. So um, since both my parents had to work, um, you know, outside the home, it was my grandmother who raised me and my two sisters. And then my dad actually had a a, a swing shift job, so he went to work at three o'clock in the afternoon and came home at two o'clock in the morning every weekday. Which meant that when I came home from school, when my sisters and I came home from school, it was my grandmother who was the mom figure who, who was there to, to take care of us um, uh, when we were kids, and it was my mom who came home from work from the factory in the afternoon at dinner time, right, to lay down the law, <laughs> right. And so, I, we only saw saw my dad over over the weekends. So in a sense, even though I sort of feel like I grew up in a fairly patriarchal Cuban American household. The patriarchy that was sort of um, in, in place day in day out that I experienced most directly was the one that my, that the women in my family, that my mother, that my mother and grandmother, um, kind of uh, uh, enforced, right? Which is different than having a really sort of you know um, domineering autocratic father in the house who's really sort of being the one to lay down the law. So I think that made my, my relationship with my masculinity masculinity different anyway. But I was still the oldest and the only boy. So guess what? Right? I was a prince. <laughs> and um, I was, I always, you know, I, I, once we could afford it, I always had my own room, and my two sisters always had to share a room. Um, I could go anywhere, anywhere. Like, you know, I, we, I grew up before the helicopter parenting thing started to happen, right? So as long as I was home by dinner time, you know, from between school and, uh, and, and dinner, and as long as I did my homework, I was free to roam the world. And your sisters. And, and my sisters were not, right? I mean, they were just... My grandmother just 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 oversaw their lives like this, you know, 
Um, I, mean, I like to say that I was, I was sort of raised by a pack of, of Cuban she wolves. But there's really <laughs> more of my sisters than I was that were that were that were raised that way. I was I was allowed to be kind of a you know, yeah, a, a, a wanderer, right? I mean, I, I I had a freedom that I, I, and I know now that that actually that all of the, all the privileges that I had, that I got came at, came at my sister's expense, right? Um, and that a lot of sort of the life the life that I've been able to have. Is different because because I was raised so differently than my sisters, even in the same household. So patriarchy did one thing for me and did another thing for them. But lucky me, a you know being gay in a sense sort of meant that I was never going to have a certain relationship to women in terms of how I was going to relate to them sexually. So that meant that I didn't have to prove a certain thing about my masculinity through that. Okay, and then I was you know once once it was cool that I wasn't going to be an athlete, and once it was cool because I was getting great grades and because I was a really good student and everything else and had my own my own my own set of ambitions, right? Um, that was fine. I, you know, it was it was fine. And, and, and I came out much later. I came out in my late twenties. So, um, in terms of just sort of negotiating that, that was a different story. But but really, in terms of growing up and in terms of the, the the signals I got, I kind of in a weird, ironic way, had the best of both worlds. Because I didn't have I I didn't feel the pressure to be tough, which meant that I also had the freedom to be articulate. And to and to and, and and expressive, and and in a way almost kind of vulnerable, right? At the same time that I was, I, I did have the masculine privilege of knowing that I could you know run around the world and with, without a worry, and not feel vulnerable in the sense that I could just do things that, that that even today I think women don't ever think they can do on their own. At least I've noticed this in my family just by the fact that there's a lot of um, single mothers in my family, you know, men you know, typically leave. And I've noticed that through my dad, he was the oldest child, and he, you know, he was always supporting his mother. And just seeing my grandmother struggle throughout his life made him a very strong supporter of like taking care of his female cousins, his aunts, and um, his mom. And I've noticed that the way that he's raised m me and my brothers, it's more of like we are have we have the advantage. My, my sister and I have an advantage over my brothers. Because my my brothers are taught that yes, you have to be very hardworking, so kind of like that machismo principles. But at the same time, you are going to be treated just just the way your sister is. For example, I wasn't a lot; I was very limited if, um, with going out. They're going to be treated the same way. Um, for example, they we both have to go to college. We both get the same privileges at the same ages, so we're set at the same standards. But at the same time, um, my brothers have to protect my sister and I in the sense that. You still have these slight rules, but they don't get any advantage that is typically seen in society. And are they um, are they encouraged to go to college as well as brothers? Yes, they're both. We're both encouraged to go to college, and if not, they know that you know they have to work, and it's not a pretty picture. And if they've been taken to my dad's job, and they see that this is what you're going to be doing if you don't go to college. So out of both options, it's better to go to college. Look what your sister is doing. You know. This is what you can be doing. They they really encourage independence in women. My my father, you know, be independent, do as much as you want to do, but focus on education. So it's very I've noticed at least in my family that the more men that are raised by single women have a stronger protection towards women and kind of seeking for their independence rather than keeping them much as well. I was gonna ask, like, what what is that what is being a single mother do? went to go visit his father last summer and his father told my mom he was a pansy like that like because he was in touch with his feminine side and he was vulnerable he would cry um and like i guess to us we don't see that as a bad thing like we just feel like he respects women more and like he that's okay that he cries like he's allowed to do that but i've always wondered like what does that do to, to men like when they're only raised when there's no father figure when they're only raised by women like how does that challenge their how will people see them going forward, you know, in their relationships with women and like how, they, how are they going to be looked at in, right. a, in Latino society? I mean, it's interesting. <laughs> well, you never know. <laughs> yes, I've been interrupted by Professor Ortiz. Um, that's an interesting question because I think right away, machismo is a big part of that question, like, 
what does it do to men and their masculinity to be raised by women? What does it do to anyone to be raised by a woman? And the response is, if you're in a culture where machismo is a part of it, like your dad's response, which is, you know, you. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry, okay. Um, his response is, it'll turn you into a sissy. Professor Ortiz wanted to call this um, evening machismo is for sissies, which I thought was a great title. Because ultimately, it is, it's about fear, it is about being afraid. And it's like his dad is afraid that he won't be a man, he won't be tough and strong enough. And it's a perpetuate. I, it perpetuates everything we're talking about. I think um, I teach a course on motherhood now, actually, a couple of people who are in the class. And um, the idea that being raised by women is this thing that could distort your sense of manhood is I can't even begin to fathom that. But I understand that culturally, that's a big idea. Freud said that people. Young men are gay because their mothers are too attentive to them. So it's certainly embedded in the culture. Um, yeah, so if we take a step back and look at the world that we live in today and look at all the different ways that it's changing, right? Um, you know, I, I just think we're living in really sort of historically interesting times. And I think that. Um, for those of us who, whether our families have been in this country for generations or were much more, more recently immigrated, right? Um, the cultural shifts that we've gone through and that sort of immigrants coming to this country from more traditional cultures are, are going through, from you know, just making that move from, from more traditional spaces to, to a place that, that's much more sort of defined by a certain kind of liberal modernity, right? Um, that, you know, in, in the ways that, that we, once we get here, are, are starting to sort of uh, figure out the ways that we can survive here and even thrive here that in a sense require that we negotiate and kind of, you know, um, uh, refuse to conform or, or fail to conform to the, the demands of the traditional cultures that we're from. Um, that's part of a larger sort of um, process of modernity that, that I think is sort of bigger than us, right? And that if you look especially at this country and other places where, um, you know, feminism certainly has sort of changed the game in terms of what's possible for women, right? Um, but, and where um, anti-homophobia is starting to really change the game for what's possible for people who you know who are queer identified and along that whole spectrum, um, and I think that I think that even marriage equality is part of this picture, right? That um, the, the the whole sort of the, 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 the structure and what's possible in terms of how how we reproduce and how we how we raise the, you know succeeding generations of young people into this world is 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 such a rapidly shifting. Um, picture right now, right? And we, we plug into it as immigrants from Latin America in this country in a particular way. But I think that, you know, I think we're, for that reason, I think we're still going to hear for a couple more generations this story of the sort of the sense of the loss, the loss of, of possible masculinity because um, young boys are no longer being raised in households where there's at least one man who espouses this kind of traditional a masculinity. Man, right. right? Or well, not necessarily straight, but yeah, you know, um, I mean, there's there some, anyway. So, um, so, so, I, I, I think it's fascinating. I think it's more like you know, make some popcorn and watch the movie because it's going to be really interesting to watch what happens in the next generation and a half. And for those of us who teach, you know, at the university, we get to see it in a really particular way because we see these waves upon waves of young people come to our come to our institutions with really, really different life stories now than the ones that we heard 15 or 20 years ago. And so. Um, I, I think we're in the middle of a very, as I said, this is, I think this is a really fascinating sort of ongoing process, but um, I, A, there is no such thing as um, an utterly natural and inescapable form of either masculinity or femininity, femininity that we would all be naturally growing into if everything was perfect. And if every family was sort of like the way that the, tr the traditional family was supposed to be, where, and again, where everything is perfect. That's actually never historically existed. But to the extent that we sort of thought it did, because more people were doing it than not, um, I think we're. I think we. I think we. we I think that ship has sailed. I, I think. I think there still can be traditional families. I just think they're one option among many, many others, and eventually we won't think of one as more traditional than the other. So I think that that's where we're headed. So again, I think in terms of like, what, 
um, even this, this current generation of, of, of adolescents, let's say kids who are like between 10 and 16 right now, and, and let's say mostly in the sort of in the, in the developed world, what they're seeing in terms of the kinds of options they have to go into the world gender, just gender, right? It's totally different than what I thought my options were in the 1970s. And that I thought my options were in the 1950s and 60s, which go back to changing my name again. But it's, I mean, just to support that, because this all sort of, I love the way it all sort of connects. Um, in the motherhood class, what many people want to know, well, women are natural mothers, right? And that's kind of what you're suggesting, that women know how to raise children. They know it in a way that men don't know. And um, that's, women are made to do that. And certainly, in this course, we <laughs> argue with that construction of motherhood. But to my mind, what Ricardo is saying about there'll be lots and lots of ways to have families. When I think about parenthood as being gendered, there's a father who's tough and he's going to protect. And that whole word, that protection thing, makes me so uncomfortable. But his job is to help protect, in particular, the weaker women. You have to be protected if you're a woman because you're weaker. Otherwise, you don't have to be that protective. Is I think that gay marriage, where you have two parents of the same gender, is going to change that whole discussion because what is mother going to mean? What is father going to mean? We can no longer attach mother means woman, father means God. And perhaps we'll drop that language altogether and talk about parenting children, which I think that we're getting to that place. So right, the whole idea that men are naturally this way. I, my concern is that if many, many young women in my classes, many of you I've spoken with, is that I think someone started the discussion talking about there are more women leading organizations on this campus, there are more women, so why, you know, why are they less powerful? I have a lot of young women who come to me who are struggling with their own families whose fathers did not want them to come two or three thousand miles to Georgetown, who have had to fight very hard to do that, who love their fathers understand where their fathers came from, but have to negotiate, here I am at Georgetown, I do have some empowerment. Uh, here's my dad telling me, come back to California, come back to Texas, you're alone out there, what's gonna happen to you? So I think it steps forward and steps back. And again, I think it will change in, in generations, but I think Lots of you, both young men and young men, women in this room, are still, you got feet in five or six different worlds, and you're figuring out, because you only have two feet, so you're trying to figure out how to do that anyway. But how, which way are you going to go, and how you put all those things together? So I'm totally in agreement with everything you said tonight, Roberta. <laughs> We'd love to hear from you, I mean, just in terms of your own experiences. Yeah. And I guess I want to throw a question out to like everybody. Um, since we were talking about traditions right now, like the whole protection aspect of it, um, how does that play into like just like the relationship roles, in terms of not just like you know the father like daughter kind of thing, but like right. within a relationship, the whole like who pays for the first meal. <laughs> Who asks anybody out on a date? Are you gonna hold the lady, like the door for the lady? Who do you hold it for? Are you supposed How to? I think she's a lady. I mean, that's a question that comes up, and you know, we talk about gender theory, and um, so, gosh, look, I think I held the door for you today. Is it possible? Yeah, it's no, quite possible. It's possible. Yes, yeah, it's quite okay. possible. I hold the door for human beings. Human beings hold the door for me. Um, when somebody holds the door because I'm a lady, I'm still one of those old-fashioned feminists you know, who gets a little angry sometimes. And I don't hold the door for me because you think I'm a fucking lady. <laughs> is that bad? <laughs> Um, I said, I'm one of that generation that gets 
little angry. I'm not from that other time. I would never speak that way, really. Uh, this is unreal. Um, but yeah, I think that those things are vestiges. And I think this idea that women need to be protected by men. I want to be protected by my friends, by the people I love, um, by my students, by my children. I want to protect as many people as I love that I can. But I don't see it as a gendered thing. I protect my grandchildren because they're little two-year-olds, four-year-olds. Um, sometimes I protect my sons, but I, but you know, my sons have protected me. I protect my husband, um, who you know, grew up in a household that his experiences were a lot like a lot of the ones that you're talking about, and he's dealt with these issues for years. But to gender love and protection and respect and kindness and money, I think, <laughs> is problematic. So you go out to dinner together, you decide as two human beings. What do two gay women do? I mean, you can't say you pay because you're the man. <laughs> and you can't say you pay because you're the, you know, I'm the girl, you're the guy. So you negotiate it as human beings. Go, like, go by income. Yeah. <laughs> in, income and or age. So, you know, <laughs> the one who makes more, the more money pays. The one who's older pays. Just you know, they're all the way. Yeah. That is so <laughs> we go out from time to time. I am both. Well, I'm definitely older, and I have a second income. But hey, so now I get it. That's why I was paying. <laughs> Not true. We do it as friends. Actually, I have, a, I have a question for Professor Velez, and actually, to any woman not here who can answer after she does, but um, what are your sentiments or feelings or thoughts about like woman appreciation events, dinners, and things like that, and why do you feel that way about it? Look, I get it. I get the reasons for that because women have been so unappreciated. But um, it's okay. But I don't want to be appreciated because I'm a, a woman in a particular position. I like appreciation dinners that appreciate me because of something I've done or said or made happen or but not just because I'm a woman. I mean do we ever have man appreciated dinners? For the same reason we don't have a national organization for men. Exactly. We have society. Exactly. It's all set up to appreciate exactly. them. Exactly. It still yeah. is, right? It still is. So here's the thing, I mean we, the, the gender dynamics are, are changing, right? So we do we live we live we definitely I think I'm pretty sure this is right, that we live in a female majority country. Just about. A little bit. Just about, okay. Um, I, you know, I think in terms of the power structure in this country, eventually there will, we will be shattering more glass ceilings, but it's going to take some time, right? But the fact is, I think we still live in a world where there's just a kind of um, reflexive uh, uh, appreciation, right, of, of masculinity and of men. Um, that 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 is this is one of the things we're talking about that does that has ironically started to hurt men in ways that I don't think people sort of um, uh, um, anticipated, right? Um, and and uh, so so yeah, but I think in general it's it's still the case that um, yeah you, I mean I mean Professor Bellas is right like if we were going to appreciate her <laughs> in, in in you know at Georgetown the reason to, to appreciate Professor Bellas is that she's she's done a remarkable she has changed this institution in remarkable ways oh. yeah through all the work that she's done. Right. Um, her, her leader, if, even even if all we even if all we're talking about is her leadership of the scholars program for the decades that she's led it, absolutely, Georgetown is a different and better place because of the list of Dallas. Right. So that's appreciating her, and and in some ways, you know, I think part of her leadership style is tied to the fact that her experiences as a woman have probably have have, have shaped them right in ways that I think have made that have are, are part of what's great about, it. but. That's different than just sort of, yes. you know, hooray uh, so for, for, for the gender, hooray for, for the gender. Right? <laughs> 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 so why, why are you asking that question? What's, what's uh, just because like, I've heard about some of these events in the past. I, I kind of just know her sentiments about it already. And once like, everyone else is speaking about that, how do they feel about it? <laughs> so like, now that she said that, how, does, how do people feel about like, those kind of events? Sure. Yeah. I wish that. I wish that those events played out across time as opposed to that specific moment. Um, one specific example, and this is from no one I'm talking about, is a 
Welcome Center. What happened there? You got to see all the leaders of um, a bunch of organizations go up and talk about them. The one at yeah. Copley. Yes, the one at okay. Copley. And there were some people who had some comments to say about some of the leaders. And they said, oh, she doesn't look like a leader. Oh, look, that's not really like what I would expect. Or, oh, is she really a good leader? Like, mm, I don't know, she's kind of short. And whatever, and that's like, and that gets me. Like, why would you judge somebody when you haven't even heard them speak yet? And so I just wish that it wasn't so much an event as a recognition that you would give. You know, just like right now, off the cuff, it was great. You've done great work right here. You do a really good job of organizing. Yeah, I think on that same note, I might. I guess I just want to like um, expand the question a little bit. Um, like, we're all familiar with like racial microaggressions. Like, um, I guess. Lots of like the women in the room, um, but uh, I guess what are like the most common like I guess we call them uh, misogynistic like microaggressions that like you deal with them like on a day to day basis. Um, I'd like to hear from. I've had people ask me like your mom and your mom let you come here like she what? let me leave my house to go to college like I was like I don't know what that means because, because you think you're a woman of color. Because I'm a woman, like my mother let me leave. I've heard this more specifically from my own people, like from Dominican people. Like your mother let you leave your house to go to college. Like one time I got really angry and I was like, I wasn't going to be a part of a prostitution ring. Like I was going to get an education and I didn't have to ask permission for that. Like she wanted me to leave. She encouraged me to get the hell out of her house. Like, <laughs> but yes, I've been asked that and also like. Um, Um, more recently, like if I, because I'm in a relationship, like if I was going to, if I was going to, if I was going to have, like if I was going to let my kids grow, I don't even have kids, I'm not thinking about kids, but if I was going to let my kids grow up in his religion or in mine, and I was like, I don't even, I don't even know what that means, like, like they can do whatever they want to believe, whatever they want to believe. And they don't exist. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I have to go to children. <laughs> so, I mean, a lot of this, obviously, again, does um, is related to how close and how how kind of um, you know you how much you've been sort of um, uh, the word that the cultural theorists would use is interpolated into these more traditional ways of thinking, right? And thinking that this is the only way that the world can be, right? Uh, and then you watch people actually not be that way, you think, oh, how is that even possible, right? Um, I mean, I remember like in the, in, the, in the 80s watching sort of like Jerry Springer and we'd have like cross-dressers on, right? Where they were called cross-dressers, right? Uh, uh, and and some, some person in the audience would be like, that's unnatural, that's unnatural. It's right in front of your eyes, no, it's quite natural. <laughs> Look, you know, a woman can wear pants. Uh, so, so um, it's, it's uh, it, it tells you a lot about, about, about ideology, it really does. It tells you about a lot about the ways that, um, uh, you know, factors in the world that actually are not at all uh, natural or God-given feel that way to people um, who, for whatever reason, uh, have, have, been, have been, you know, and I want, I'm not saying brainwashed, it's, it's a, it, we're, all, we're all sort of in a way kind of the, the you know, subjects of ideology of one, of one, of one sort or another. Um, but, but yeah, just where, where um, you, you hold on to um, ways of thinking that the world is, um, even when the world right in front of your eyes is changing in ways that, that you won't ever be able to stop. And, and that in a sense it aren't bad, aren't bad changes, aren't bad things that are happening. Um, and maybe you're actually positive to the extent that they're more liberating, right, and more empowering of more people. Um, you know, isn't that what you want if we're all ultimately equally, equally human? I mean, in terms of misogynistic microaggression, I would say never went so It's a really long time. So I don't feel it the way I think younger women do and might. I feel like I've defended the whole, myself as a woman, you know, I've done that. There were situations, I think, for what all was, of us. What was it like when you first got came to Georgetown? Well, it's funny, because last night, 
I was on a panel at the Women's Empowerment House. I know that it's right down from Renaissance House. And um, we talked about that. So I came to Georgetown as a graduate student. And this, and I'll just tell you a couple of things. Um, this was in 1980. And I had gone to graduate school in New York before that. I had a master's. Um, I came here for a master's program, and I never left. That's kind of my story. <laughs> and that's a whole other story. But um, the, for the two years that I was here in the program, I had have one woman as a professor, as an undergraduate. I never had a woman as a professor. When I got a master's in Columbia in New York, I never had a woman as a professor. And if, if, if one thinks about that now, to me, that is just unbelievable. So when I came here, the English department was male. There were, there was Joan and Leona and Judith okay. Barr, and she was later. Okay. Um, there were, I think there were three assistant professors, women in the department, one of whom sort of started the women's studies program and mentored me in ways that are just extraordinary. But I'll tell you this, there was a professor, he was, um, He's dead, but I'm not going to use his name. But this was very, very common. Um, he taught critical, what we would call critical theory, but he he called criticism, literary criticism. And he would very casually sort of pat graduate women graduate students on the bum. Like he would be in the kitchen, and he would just come in and say, "Hey." It Don't never, <laughs> and I was like, I would be, you know, excuse me, but that's it. That's as far as I went. I wasn't like, don't touch me, how dare you, what the hell do you think you're doing? Um, because at that time, he was old, and he was kind of losing it a little, and I sort of felt this, oh, poor old guy, whatever. But when that happened with younger women, I was 35 when I came back to grad school here, it's a whole different thing. You can feel absolutely intimidated. And there are ways in which I was intimidated. But I feel like I was at a point in my life where it wasn't as destructive as it could be. Look, I mean, the place where misogyny has gotten to me the most in the last several years, it's, it, it's so hard for me to go to the movies and not get angry at movies that I actually like. And I'm like, okay, turn off. I'm gonna go see American Hustle, and there's so many great things about it. I don't care if I have to look at Amy Adams' bosom so much, <laughs> or why we have to look at her. It, but, and it's sort of like when I read Jenna Diaz, I sometimes want to turn that off. But it's like you learn to look at the world, and all of you, in terms of race, in terms of class, in terms of sexual orientation, in terms of gender, you put these glasses on, and they're on. They're like permanent contact lenses. You cannot re-see the world, I don't think. But you also, I think, to go around being angry all the time is so hard, and you guys know that, I mean, that, that people make you angry so much. And I'm not saying that you can control that, but the, the purposes to which you put that anger. And I have students over and over who say, people say, where are you from? And they say, Chicago. And then the person says, no, no. Where are you really from? And the degree to which, and you guys tell me, the degree to which that is. I mean, do you get to a point where, like, this person just is ignorant, or does it sort of make these feelings inside of you over and over again? Um, okay, so I guess I should find it out. Um, I say I'm from Chicago because I know that. Um, What's the thing about you? Okay, but yeah, but that's where I'll start. Right, that's where you're from. I was born in Chicago, raised in Cicero, 
which is like 10, 15 minutes away from Chicago. Um, and you know, people still get upset about that because I say I'm from Chicago even though it's like right there, it's right next to Chicago, Cicero. Um, but then if I were to say I'm from Cicero, oh, I don't know where that is. So there's no point in me saying. Um, so, um, in terms of like um, machismo, uh, well, you know, Chicago is um, predominantly Hispanic, if not all. Um, I went to school in Crystal Ray, which is right at the heart of Pilsen. Um, and Pilsen is a very Mexican populated um, community. Um, and essentially that's where I was raised too because I went to a church there. I went to school there for high school. Um, and in terms of machismo, my dad used to, um, used to be a very whole, like he would hold those ideals to the core from the moment he crossed the border um, in, in Mexico with my mom because my mom was like, no, you're not leaving without me. I am not letting you leave me like the rest of the women <laughs> in my, <laughs> In my rancho, I'm not letting you leave me. Um, and that's where my mom has been an undercover feminist, even though she doesn't, even though she doesn't acknowledge it. I tell her, you are. Um, and this is where my dad's life began to change. And my mom, from the start, told like, would always be like, no, why do you have to do this? Why, why do, why do you have to follow whatever your dad? Says that you have to, whatever ideals he taught you. Um, and again, my grandfather was absent in my dad's upbringing because my grandfather kept coming at a very young age as well as a lot of like the campesino workers in California kept coming um, every summer to the U.S. Uh, and then going for the winter back to uh, Guanajuato, which is where we're from. Um, and there was a point in their marriage when my mom just couldn't handle um, how private my dad was in not showing his emotions and not wanting to talk about financial issues. Um, and their work hours were like a lot of us, I think a lot of people, um, especially in Latino communities have, and other um, minorities have struggled with that their parents wouldn't even see each other sometimes because their work shifts were so different. Um, and this is where I started seeing, from a very young age, I started seeing the differences in gender roles um, because my dad was way different than my mom. Um, my dad would be more um, to himself and slowly I started gaining those characteristics as he did. So in terms of my emotions, I was like, no. I can't show my emotions, sorry. Um, but then I also started gaining the strength to be more independent because of my mother. Um, and when problems began and they were about to get a divorce because um, m there was also like verbal abuse there too. Um, so when they, when they were about to get a divorce, my dad finally was the one that was like, had to go to therapy. My mom convinced them, I don't know how, I still can't get that story, but my mom convinced them they both went to the church where they were at, and they went to counseling. Um, because my mom was like, I love my daughters, and I am gonna protect them, and I want to be with them, so you decide, do you want to be with me, or do you want to be without, without us? Uh, because essentially that's what it was going to come down to. Um, and so when he was like, no, I can't, I can't live without you guys. Um, so he started going to therapy and that's where, um, after he changed, that's when he was starting to feel the pressure of society to be this masculine, masculine ideal. Because people even still come to him and he was like, and not, not to be mean, but he was even, he even was being flirted by a guy at his job because my dad was, was less of like 
the masculine archetype. Oh, we're all right around the corner, very popular. And it's not like I was like. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> so open the door. Um, <laughs> see, now I lost my third. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, so, but you changed your dad. And... Um, yeah, so then, um, and that's, I feel like I've had the pressure more on society than on my family itself. Because for my family, as soon as I told them, I didn't even ask, honestly. I didn't even ask, oh, I'm, can I go to Georgetown? No, I said, I'm going to Georgetown. I'm like, I got the scholarship, and I was like, okay, I'm going to Georgetown. It's 11 hour drive. You decide if you want to drive me or not. Yeah. <laughs> um, I love, and I love my family. Like, Professor Velez knows that I adore. I adore my sister. I adore my dad. I adore my, my mother because they've been those role models for me. Um, and so, um, my dad is the one that kind of still has trouble understanding my sister and I, but he, he finally came out to, came out and told me, he's like, I'm glad that your mom has been a pivotal role in my life because she has led me to understand you and because I've been able to make this relationship with you work because she has allowed me to not fully engage in like the, um, the, a woman's uh, train of thought, but she has given me enough to understand you and to understand why you grew and developed this way um, and your ideals are different than mine. Um, and he even um, told me, he's like, before I would not be open to you about telling you the, the men that I know of, he's like, he's like, why do you think I get scared as soon as you tell me I have a, that you have a boyfriend? He's like, I am not going to lie to you anymore. I think you're old enough, you're 19, and you're old enough to know that I get scared when you say you have a boyfriend because I know that although there exists like men that are like me that are not so much on the physical because I don't know how my mom even found my dad, but <laughs> my dad was one of like one in a million. Like my dad didn't think of my mom so much as in the physical sense that he wanted to be with her. My dad, my mom was his first girlfriend and who he ended up with was he, she, he told me your mom is a only one and only woman in my life. And it was different for my mom. My mom was like, no, I had a lot of <laughs> <laughs> We doubt your mom and dad deserve some more privacy. That's a good <laughs> But other than that, like that's what essentially it is. Thank you. I have a question. Uh, Professor, you uh, raised a really good point over uh, how uh, like, the, micro, the uh, gender based microaggressions that make you the most angry is when you go to the movies. Uh, pop culture has a huge role to play in our lives. Mm -hmm. And when I think of pop culture, I think of it like one of those fun house mirrors in the circus where you look at yourself, but your head is huge, or like your body is like shifted to the left. In other words, they show us as a society and a culture, but it's like exaggerated. Um, as, as far as perhaps Latino culture, what role? Uh, what do you guys think is the role of like pop culture, particularly Latino pop culture, and like um, either perfect, like you know, same like you know the same the things we discussed earlier, or perhaps it says something different. Uh, for example, uh, I think of like bachata, which is a hugely popular genre of music among Latinos. Uh, uh, the, the the most popular person in that genre is a Romeo. You guys want Romeo? 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 Romeo. Romeo. <laughs> Romeo. Why, is there, why is there a female Romeo, for example? Well, wait, but wait. I mean, before we even get to a female, I mean, why does everybody love, you know, Al Pacino and Scarface? Why do you go through doors where there's all these pictures all and Al Pacino like was like, you know, well, what does he say? Hello, my little friend. Say hello to my little friend. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, those are exaggerated. 
But what I did on pop culture really quickly is I think it's incredibly complicated. I consume pop culture. In fact, Professor Ortiz and I, there are a couple of shows that we both watch, and sometimes 11 o'clock on Sunday night, we're texting one another. And I think there are multiple, multiple readings of so much of pop culture. Um, and you know, we get women, you know, it's like, why wasn't there a strong women Disney character? Some people say, oh, there has been, there's been women of color, but I would say, nah, they're all still stuck in that familiar gender role. Have you seen Frozen? No, <laughs> <laughs> but you know. I'm kidding, I haven't seen it, I just got to do it. I don't see any of this, man. You know, the first one was like Pocahontas, and people were saying, look, Disney made a movie about Native Americans. But, oh, right. But they all look at Zion. What? But I think Michael Hansen. Say it again. They don't have a Hispanic princess yet, though. Oh, yeah. Right. I mean, why do we have to have a machete? Is that less than a woman? That's good. Right? Yeah. But. So what, what? What was your question about? So, so <laughs> there, needs be, there needs to be a female Romeo. Is that what you're saying? Like, why isn't there a female Romeo? What does that mean? Like, why isn't there like at least as far as the in a quote, at least to the extent of my knowledge, maybe maybe I'm accused of this uh, Like a like a very popular, very like dominant female. Icon. Okay. At least in the genre of bachata. Oh. Oh. Okay. Okay. Not, because this, because yeah. the studio culture is full of dominant <laughs> people. <laughs> so, again. But I think nope. it's really just in the United States. Like, come on. Most yeah. of the people here are not, like, you know, in the island where bachata is produced. Uh -huh. yeah. Like, they, like, Monte Alexandra, like, you know, she was great. I mean, yeah, she had a guy partner, but yeah, she yeah. was great. Um, she was great Carlos Alejandra. Um, like, if you go to DR, you do have Juliana. a lot of, yeah, Juliana, you have a bunch of like female bachata singers, it's just, they're not big in the United States, whereas from male, he started his career here with Aventura, like he was American bo born, well, <laughs> awkward. <laughs> um, so I, I think it's related to that, like, it's just on the culture that we're in right now. It helps, I think, um, maybe like, uh, another way to look at that question is, um, would, like, would, would you as a man feel as comfortable singing a love song about a guy? You know, like, uh, like all, like, the content is all about like. Little Miguel basically worships women. Yeah. <laughs> right, and um, and, and, and that's like, always oh, pop. When these guys are worshiping women, there's a problem. Yeah. <laughs> that's okay. That's, that's okay. <laughs> yeah. Let, let, let's define worship, right? You know, like, is it a very serious sort of religious okay. worship? <laughs> <or is> it... <laughs> <laughs> no, um, but I guess the question is like, as a society, like, are we ready to, you know, to, to to have men objectified in the same way. Okay, right. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, we are. Well, we are, actually. But, but pop, cult pop culture is a, is a weird thing. Okay, pop, pop culture is um, a hugely complicated issue, right? Because even if you're just thinking about it in terms of culture, in terms of US American versus Latino, Latin American, um, you know, the, the sort of, um, you know, I guess the theorist who, who articulated this best in the mid-90s when all these technologies were starting to emerge is a guy named Ar uh, Arjuna Padurai, who's um, a you know, South Asian Indian uh, extraction, uh, uh, sort of an anthropologist of, of globalization. Talks about sort of these different sort of um, environments that we live in that these technologies and these new sort of economic structures sort of put in place. And one of them is what he calls a kind of transnational media scape. Right? So imagine sort of like the complexity of the transnational media scape where um, Latin American pop culture and U.S. American and Latino American pop culture all converge and overlap, right? So um, what's weird about this country, like as somebody who teaches pop culture sometimes in my Latino lit classes, right? Um, but in an English department, one of the things I always have to say, right, is that I'm mostly looking at English language stuff from an English language broadcast uh, networks or um, uh, you know corporations or from English language feature programming, even if it's from cable or wherever else. I'm not doing Spanish language stuff. Well, this is a country that's, that's so so Hispanophone and so full of this whole other space of culture that comes right out of Latin America and is doing a more purely Latin American thing, right? That um, that the two together sort of um, are still a very weird and kind of uneven mix. So, um, you know, yeah, I think it's one thing if you're, if you're thinking about stuff that actually has a, uh, a a strong anchor in in the home countries, right? Whether it's the DR or Mexico or or, or 
you know, um, I mean, Puerto Rico's not a country, but we'll say it is. Um, <laughs> but you know what I'm saying, or, 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 um, or Colombia, or anywhere else where there's like, especially anywhere where there's a large, robust media culture, right? So, um, so I think that that part of it is a mixed bag, but, um, but the, the other thing about pop, pop, pop culture is that pop culture is a commercial enterprise whose key, um, uh, you know, um, motivation in the world, it's, it's reason to exist, is to make profit in, in the ways that it entertains you, right? And how it entertains you is not by appealing to your political correctness. It's appealing to much more basic impulses that you have and more basic kinds of responses you're going to have to stimulus, to stimulation, to visual stimulation, to oral stimulation, to whatever stimulation you get from wanting to follow certain kinds of stories and not others, right? So at that point, this is no longer about making sort of rational calculations about what's a politically correct uh, uh, representation of a woman or a man or anybody. It's more about, hey, I want to see that happen again, <laughs> right? Wow, look at that. Here, I'll pay money to keep watching that. <laughs> That's, that's what pop, you know, or, or, or wow, I love that song. I want to hear that song again. So for whatever, in whatever way you need to sort of add this other um, dimension to that, to, that, to, to that question, right, to, to any analysis you would do of pop culture, is that it's, 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 it's hardwired in a really different way than maybe real life is, though they touch up, up against one another and, and, and they, they mutually sort of interact and mutually reflect and mutually respond to one another. But... Um, but pop culture, you know, is, is, is weird and probably will remain weird just because it, it isn't appealing to our, higher, our highest instincts. It's often appealing to our lowest. Or, to, or let me say, to our more basic instincts. Yeah, but there's times that pop culture can feel like resistance to the larger culture as well. So, I mean, it gets you in so many different but it has, in which case, it usually has to be very smart and very subtle and very strategic about the ways that it does it, because the one thing that it's, you know, it's, it's, it's just so hard to sort of put out material. And again, this is an ongoing debate in, in culture in general about who, who an authentic artist is, what a genuine artist is, what genuine artistry is, you know, and, and what it means to be that and not sell out, right? And selling out is bad. But if you're not going to sell out, if you're going to insist on not selling out, you're asking for, for a particular kind of visibility in culture. And I'm being cynical here because I think it's, you know, if you're going to talk about pop culture, pop culture, I think you have to be. Um, it's not about every kind of art or every kind of artistry, but but that's that's where that's where the struggle is, right? That's where that's where that's where the dialectic is. Um, also, just going off of that, um, media yeah. really does feed off of making us feel self-conscious, and I feel like that's one of the biggest things that fuels machismo. Because I, at least this is one of my problems with um, journalism. I, I am forward for equality in gender, depending on what that may be. Sometimes having the same rights isn't enough. Um, but my issue is when sometimes when people try to prove a point about how, how much feminism you know, needs to continue going on, but then at the same time that's pushing back men. And I feel like that's going back to bringing it to machismo. Because once you're, you're oppressing another gender, we're going back to the same thing that we were. Well, I mean, I would really, really hope that feminism isn't about oppressing yeah. another gender. And um, I mean, I think men are feminists. So I mean, I, I don't think that we're dividing feminists or women and men are machismo. I do believe that men in many cultures can feel threatened by feminists. And I think that's kind of perhaps what you're saying. Um, and the other thing, I think you said something really important, because I don't think feminism is necessarily about equality, because equality, you know, assumes you've got to be equal to something, and that something is a man. But as you said, it's it's not about equality. It's the same. It's about well, it's about a lot of things. But I don't want to be in a position where I want to be equal to a man. I do want legal rights, the same legal rights that any human being has. But I don't see feminism as creating more machismo or more misogyny. I feel like that it empowers both men and women. I mean, we started talking about machismo as destructive, not just to women, it's destructive to men. And feminism should be empowering to men. And should be. Why is it showing different? Huh? Why is it showing different? What do you mean? Like, um, it seems like sometimes, um, well, like you said, it seems like it, um, feminism 
intimidates men to a certain extent. It seems like it. Not all men. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the key. <laughs> well, not all men. Doesn't scare me. And maybe it's, I think that's exactly the men who are intimidated. Maybe that's, it's sort of like, listen, your story, which is a beautiful story, um, your mother could have intimidated your father, and maybe she did, into doing something. But I would think intimidated is that their challenges, I think, in all of these new ways of being that we're talking about. So yes, it sounds like your dad was challenged. And then feminism is certainly, it's a challenge not just to men, it's a challenge to women to live according to the theories that I have about feminism. That's pretty complicated too, and I don't do a great job all the time. So. Yeah, I think whenever the status quo is, is, is threatened, people in turn feel threatened. No, sure. Yeah. To care about balance. And it's, and, it's, and it's hard, and peer pressure is a, is a, is a really, you know, it's, a, it's an irresistible force in our lives. And the fact is that when you're, you know, when we're still all, I mean, whatever, I mean, you know, we're, we're all, we're both, I'm, I'm old too. Um, uh, old enough now to sort of look back on, on a lot of this and go, okay, well, I'm, I'm just, I don't, I'm not susceptible to that kind of peer pressure anymore. I'm just not, right? But when I was, I was. And, and, it, and, it, and it happened across all the different sort of, um, uh, phases of my experience of growing up, right? So it was one thing when I was still trying to be a straight boy in junior high and high school. Um, but it turned into a different thing once I was out, because it it's not like I, I left peer pressure behind when that happened. It was just a whole other kind of peer pressure that, that you know, um, gay men sort of impose on one another, and, and, and still do, right? So, um, but also that, like watching, watching my sisters and watching my, my, my friends who were women, you know, when they were sort of alone on their own, or sort of when Whenever there was a moment where I sort of encountered one of them sort of having an interest in a in a in a man, right? Just how, how they would change, just because you know then these impulses sort of kick in to sort of conform more to the way that you think you need to behave to get what you want or to please a certain person or to or to pass as a certain way in in that in that peer environment. That's you know uh, I think there's only so much that people like us can do to intervene <laughs> or to or to help you sort of figure out what to do with your peers. Because that's that's where that's where the rubber meets the road for you guys, and I, I just, you know, we're we're not there when those and, and and I would imagine most people, most your parents, other people aren't there when those conversations happen. And you know, it's weird having Facebook now. I mean, I think that as a, again as an older person who never thought when I was in my 30s and even into my 40s that by the time I hit 50, half of you know, like I have 80 friends on my Facebook page from high school. And I was not friends with all those 80 people when I was in high school, right? But to the extent that they've all come back in my life like ghosts that I just, you know, <laughs> that I never thought I'd see alive again, right? I've done a lot of reflecting on just how, how amazingly influential we were over one another. Like, those teen years, and into, into college, it was true with my college friends as well, we were just like, like larger than life to one another. We were caught in really sort of, um, you know, just, just, just like relationships that lasted and that got really intense and really, Codependent. It didn't matter whether they were sexual or what, or, or just friends or whatever, and across genders and everything else. I mean, those people who were my peers during those really formative years were like, you know, we were like, we we're like walking mythologies to one another. That's the way I would put it. So you guys just have a really powerful, powerful effect on one another, for good or and for bad. Yeah, good right? and for bad. Um, and I just, I, I wish you all the best in, in, <laughs> navigating, in navigating that terrain because we're just not in it. With we're on, we're, on a we're, we're on a different time. Professors, thank you so much for what's been a very stimulating discussion. Uh, if we could just have to give the professor here a round of applause. For our <laughs> and to come and speak to us. Uh, and just, you know, the conversation doesn't have to end here today. We can take the lessons that we've learned here in our discussions and, and apply them to the outside world to continue to fight the good fight. So thank you. Thank, thank you for doing this. Thank you for the food. Please have a chance to see left. Thank you for having us. Thank you, guys. We'll get to see you. So I get to fly out tomorrow morning to Montreal for my first ever gay bachelor party weekend. Bachelor party? Is that what our new house is still starting? I'm like really, I'm like really creeped out now. Like, what is this? How about nice? I don't like, no, I'm like, now I don't want to sleep in the so, bed. Um, I'm going to be closer to the door. Take, 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 take,
That's so scary. I think I'm going to call my mom. And really, if you could just make it to, to Justin Torres and Jimmy Santiago Baca, that would be great. I talked to my mom today. I told her, hey. Is that all you said? Thanks for the clothes. <laughs> <laughs> so, the next time you talk to my cousin, <laughs> she knows all about me. <laughs> 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 just, just wait until, just wait until I get to be at your retirement party. Oh, wait. Oh, wait. Oh, wait. So it's in English, we friendly say, I saw a lady do something. And it's like, you don't even know she's a lady, you know she's a woman, right? But it's, it's just, it's like a formal, it's like a formality in Spanish. That's Thank you. 